everybody, welcome to another episode of Buy or Bust, the game show where Brendan and I find you three crazy cool or less than cool classics. We tell you whether or not you should buy or bust them, and then we guess what they're going to sell for at auction. And what are we doing today, Brendan? Today, we have picked three vehicles that we disagree on. It may not be uh, one that you love, may not be one that I love, but... Yeah, we're going to have a little bit of argument on, the, on these, I guess. Yeah, I always love a little bit of arguing, and we're starting off with one of my all-time favorite vehicles, bar none, the Mercedes-Benz G. I cannot believe you don't like the G-Wagon. Well, I like the G-Wagon. I just, uh, I don't think they're worth the price. Well, they do go for a pretty penny. And at the end of this segment, we're gonna guess what this thing's gonna sell for and then show you how much it sells for here at Dealers Auto Auction of the Rockies. But let's talk about this little beast. So the G-Wagon introduced was introduced in the late 1970s as a Middle Eastern military vehicle. And then they just kept building it and selling it. And this one is one of the best of the breed. Yeah, so this is a 2013 G63 AMG. So it's, it's pretty powerful uh, V8 twin turbo. I think it's what, 544 horsepower? Yeah, let's pop this open guy. that hood. Let's see. Let's check this thing out. So basically, this vehicle launched with a plethora of little tiny gasoline engines and diesel engines, because these were intended to be used on the farm and intended to be used um, in... <laughs> <laughs> That's Mercedes, it's like a vault, right? It doesn't want you to open the hood. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> These were intended to be used for commercial use, so they weren't designed to go fast. But by the early 2000s, Mercedes said, you know what? Screw that. Twin turbo V8. Well, yeah, this was like a military vehicle. Back from, what did you say, 1979? Yeah. This was essentially the same vehicle they had been making since 1979. And then they decided, well, let's let AMG have it and put in a twin turbo V8. I mean, could you imagine if they made a Hummer, like, performance muscly machine. It would just be ridiculous, which this is. So this <laughs> engine was handcrafted by Patrick. And Patrick, let me tell you what, you did a great job with this five and a half liter. How can you not like this concept, though, of a narrow body, body on frame vehicle, solid axles, and a twin turbo V8? Well, again, the, the price to entry is just, I mean, most people cannot afford these things, including myself. And the other thing is, is, if you could afford it, you probably couldn't afford to maintain it properly because these twin turbo V8s, correct me if I'm wrong, Tommy, but I think they're pretty expensive to maintain. Well, sure. I mean, they are very, very, for the most part, reliable, but if something does break, you are going to be paying for it. Uh, but some of the magic of the G is not only on the outside, the squared off boxy design, but the inside as well. This is the performance SUV everybody forgot about, the Jeep Grand Cherokee 5.9 Limited, and it's up for auction right now at tflbids.com. A one-year-only Jeep with 345 pound-feet of torque. This thing is rad. Check it out over at TFL Bids. So I'm going to start off the interior by talking about the exterior. Listen to the bank vault, the quality of the door close on the G-Wagon. Brendan, you can't dislike that, right, dude? That is pretty cool. And also when we uh, locked and unlocked, it sounded almost like you are locking and unlocking a bank vault. It's, uh, it is pretty impressive, I'll give you that. It, but, but there is one thing that's standing out to me that I think is kind of weird. What in the world is this? Yeah, so G-Wagons have the worst cup holders in the world. That's true. I mean, this is a compromised vehicle, and certainly <laughs> the um, military roots here are not, are, you know, are, are, are not hidden very well. You've got a very upright windshield. You sit very close to the person next to you, right? It's a very um, vertical driving position. But Mercedes um, really reintroduced this car to the U.S. in the early 2000s, like 02, 03, and then improved it over the years. So we've got well, albeit a pretty small infotainment screen by modern day standards, but you got the woods and the telephone functionality, heated and ventilated seats, and my favorite part, a true three diff lock system, one in the front, one in the center, and one in the rear. That is pretty cool, but I will say these seats are not as comfortable as I kind of expected them to be. All right, whatever. Let's take it for a spin. Let's all see right. what this thing's all about. Let's do it. Listen to that V8 purr. It is pretty nice, and I do really like that uh, that side pipe exhaust. That's pretty cool. Now, the issue with the G-Wagon is it got a reputation 
for being a Beverly Hills cruiser, right? Yeah. But the fact is, these things are pretty serious off-road performance machines. This thing will hold its own against some of the best in the world. So, you know, it holds a special place in my heart, Brendan. Yeah, it, it does kind of remind me of, like, you know, like a Range Rover, which actually does have serious off-road credibility. And build quality. Yeah, and similar build quality. Oh, no, better build quality, <laughs> Brendan. Well, okay, okay. Maybe maybe similar build quality in the engine department, at least. So this is a twin-turbo V8, 544 horsepower, as we talked about. And I think you're going to find it's one heck of an accelerator. Um, well, I, I do need to warn you, Tommy. Is it icy? It's, it's the... Uh, the the drive there is a little bit, a uh, little bit icy, a little bit snowy. Oh no! <laughs> Catastrophe! So we won't be able to get it up to quite as much speed today. Okay, we'll try Let's to give see. it at least a squirt. Traction control kicking in, but you can hear that. You can hear that V8 purr. Yeah, it sounds really good. It, it does. It, now these things do ride a little bit rougher than like an equivalent. Wow, that is sheer ice. They do ride a little <laughs> bit rougher than like an equivalent Range Rover. No air suspension and old school axles. But even still, this thing is one of my favorite vehicles of all time to drive. Now let's go find out, is it a buy or a bust? Sounds good. <laughs> all right, Tommy. It, it drove pretty well, I will give you that. But, uh, you know, I, I think I'm still gonna have to bust it. It's just not something that I would spend my cold hard money on. But I'm guessing that you are still a buy. If you have the means, how can you not love a G? Just the craziness of it is next level and the off-road capability, so I'm gonna go buy, and I predict at auction this car is going to sell for $43,000. $43,000? If it's $43,000, I might amend whether I would buy it or not, <laughs> but I think this is gonna go for a bit more. I think we're gonna be closer to the $55,000 range on this guy. So 2013, 48,000 miles, let's see what happens. Brendan, we're back here in the studio because the auction is super loud, but you were there taking notes, taking names, getting some video. Let's find out what these cars sold for. Now, first of all, that Mercedes G, I predicted $43,000. You were more optimistic at 55, what happened? So uh, it opened up at $80,000 was the original asking price on it. Oh, wow. Uh, and it, it dropped quite a bit and finally getting a bid at 65,000 and then slowly bidding back up to 68, which is where it sold for. Did it sell? It sold at 68. Wow, so I said 43, you said 55. I thought the G-Wagon market had cooled down considerably, apparently not as much as I thought. So yeah. you took that one. I'll take it. And so you don't like this thing, what do you like though? Well, let me let me show you what I would get instead. Hang on. Okay. All right, Tommy. For my pick, I have brought you the 1999 Toyota Land Cruiser, otherwise known as the 100 Series Land Cruiser. Now this is a car, and I'm going to get roasted in the comment section that I don't much like, and here's why. The 100 Series Land Cruiser is mechanically perfect, but it is so good that Toyota managed to engineer the excitement out of it. Plus it was a Land Cruiser that followed the legendary 80 series that had solid axles. Here in the US we only got the independent front suspension ones, plus it's just a little boring to look at. Pitch me on the Land Cruiser. Yeah, I mean, this is big and boxy, just like your G-Wagon, right? Sure. So it's got that military look to it. It's got that longevity. They've been building these things forever. It's huge, it's more comfortable than a G-Wagon. And my guess is it's gonna go for close to one-tenth the price of a G-Wagon, especially this one. And this is the reason why I brought this guy, because this Land Cruiser has 409 thousand miles on it. Do you think there's a G-Wagon out there with 409,000 miles on it? Because I think not. That is, well, it's incredible. 409,000 <laughs> miles. Let's pop the hood. Let's see what the engine looks like. Yeah. Now, these were sold here in the U.S. with a 4.7 liter V8. Similar engine to what you'd find in the Tundra, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and this was actually the first year uh, of the 100 series, and it was the first year that we got the V8 to attach the 4.7 liter V8, I think, what, 228 horsepower and about 300 pound-feet of torque. Not, not huge numbers by today's standards, but 
these are known to last a long, long time. Yeah, so I've got some friends who are Toyota mechanics, um, uh, Toyota Pro mechanics actually, and I've heard from them that this engine is by far the best engine Toyota has ever built. It's a timing belt engine, so you gotta stay up on timing belts, but still, 500,000 miles, a million miles out of the 4.7 is not unheard of. So the engine is spectacular. Being a 99 as well, we also have center and a rear locking differential, which is cool. Yep. But let's check out the inside. Okay, well, that's that's where uh, it's not quite as nice as a G-Wagon. Well, it's got 400,000 miles. I wouldn't expect <laughs> it to be. <laughs> now, getting in the Land Cruiser, these things are pretty darn comfortable. They really had their inspiration from Lexus by making these nice leather seats. You got a nice folding center armrest for both the driver and the passenger, and a lot of uh, fakish wood and some plastic, but you've got a manual selector to select the four-wheel drive. You've got the diff lock over here, just simple, basic design, not a lot of stuff that can break. And I mean, 400,000 miles, and there's not a single crack on that dash. Although, in Colorado fashion, the windshield is cracked. Yeah, but a crack on the dash would at least make the interior more interesting. Brendan, this is one of the most boring interiors I think <laughs> I've ever seen. And that's one of the issues with these vehicles, right? Is the 80 series is kind of retro in 80s and 90s, right? With this design, the 200 series is modern, but the 100 series, it's just boring early 2000s. Yeah, well, and that's generally what Toyota was doing back then, but you have to give it to them. Look, like this seat has 400, someone sat in this seat for 400,000 <laughs> miles and there's not a single rip in it. Yeah, the leather's starting to wear out a little bit, but there's no rips, there's no tears, there's no splitting at the seams. It is holding up. Look at even this center armrest. I mean, yeah, it's got a little bit where your elbow sits, but again, no rips, no tears, no cracks on the dash. All the, the buttons still show everything. It's still a functional interior that is presentable. All right, let's take it for a spin. Let's do it. Well, what do you think of the understated luxury of the Toyota Land Cruiser? That might mean it's boring, but to your credit, 400K. It's in really good shape. And I don't think this thing has been particularly well cared for because all four tires are completely bald. The bumper is missing, the headlights falling out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but the, even uh, still, look how well that thing runs. Yeah, I mean the check engine light is on. The uh, looks like the locker is not working. <laughs> so we'll with these bald tires and that icy uh, runway there, we're gonna have to be a little bit ginger on the throttle with this guy. But now we do have some suspension things going on right off the bat. It feels like it could need front control arms, which wouldn't be out of the ordinary for a Land Cruiser. Yeah, and I think that power steering is uh, screaming at us. It, well, it's probably on its last legs, but it still works. It still works. Oh, yeah, it is not happy. <laughs> but that just goes to show even a not well-maintained Land Cruiser of this era will last well beyond the lifetime of a lot of folks. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this thing is going to still be around when you and I are both long gone, and we're not particularly old. Now, with this rear locker, it is pretty capable off-road. The later models of this went to 8-track, essentially, which is advanced traction control. You want to give it some accelerator? So that, yeah. that light actually means that we are locked into 4-high with the center oh, diff on. Oh, there we on. go. So Look we at can that. turn that off, but it doesn't really matter for this test track. Oh. It's probably better to keep it on, yeah. It's not doing anything. It'll do it as you accelerate. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Could be stuck. Oh, oh. And with those tires, we are just spinning wheels on this thing. Yeah, we're not going very far. But... <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> Even though this bumpy test track, pretty good ride quality. You know, we got a lift yeah. on this beast. Um, it still does pr ride pretty well. I mean, it's everything has been shot on it, not been maintained, but woo, Ooh, back end oh. slipping out a little bit there. <laughs> nice, dude. Now this has a full-time four-wheel drive with a center differential, which you can lock and unlock. I love this thing. I think it's cool. I, I'm supposed to be the bad guy. I think it's a <laughs> what fine are you doing, vehicle. Tommy? <laughs> Brendan, it's fine. I don't like Land Cruiser. <laughs> Jeez, there's a little peek behind the curtain there for everybody, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Tommy. I know this thing isn't uh, mechanically the best, but uh, <laughs> would you buy or bust this 100 Series Land Cruiser? As much as I've been throwing shade on the 100 Series, it's a buy for me all day long because they are just so well made, so long lived, easily modifiable, great off-road. They are, albeit a little bit boring, a fantastic SUV. Absolutely. This is gonna be a good 
daily driver for somebody, even with 400,000 miles, you can just let the problems go, buy this thing for super cheap, and just drive it around, enjoy it, and do some off-roading. So I'm going to go for a buy as well. And as far as the price goes, I think I hinted at it earlier, saying that I think it'll be one-tenth the price of the G-Wagon, and I guess 55000 there. So I'm going to guess 5500 on this guy. I think you're a little strong. With 400,000 yeah. miles. 400, it's, that's, there's no comps out there to look at these with 400,000 miles. So it is a big guess, but you know, typically these go for a bit more than 5,500. Well, we don't have comps at all because we both forgot our phones. So I'm <laughs> going to say $4,700. We'll head to the auction. And then next up, Brendan, I'm going to go grab a truck or an SUV that we both agree upon. Brendan, the Land Cruiser went across the block next. Now, this was a 400,000 mile unit. I predicted 4,700 bucks. You thought more optimistic, 5,500. What happened? Yeah, and uh, I think you were a little bit a little bit more close than I was because this thing only opened at $2,000 and then got one additional bid and then got 2,250 bucks. Wow. That's so, it. <laughs> so not a lot of money for that Land Cruiser. No. Um, I, we were both a little optimistic. Even I, I was closer. I won that one but i thought it would go for a lot more than that it did have a lot of issues though in terms of suspension yeah and i guess some dealers just aren't willing to take a risk on a 400,000 mile vehicle in general i've tracked down a vehicle that brendan and i both completely agree on is actually a super awesome rig we are looking at the hummer h2 Yeah, I have to admit, uh, a while ago, I didn't really get these. I thought they were just kind of showy and flashy and ugly and pretentious, but I've come around. These are pretty cool. These things are freaking awesome. Now, these got such a bad rap, partly because of what's been done with this one, with all sorts of like glitzy add-ons <laughs> that don't help it off-road. But General Motors genuinely designed this thing to be a true off-road rig. Now everyone thinks, oh, it's a Tahoe with a different body. It's not, it's got 2,500 components. It's got some custom made bits to increase the ground clearance to insane levels. It's just a really cool vehicle. Let's pop the hood. You wanna grab that latch? Yep, let's do it. I think this one's already undone. <laughs> there, there's probably one inside too, okay. if you wanna pull it. Yep. So these have a forward hinging hood. Now. The deal, oh wow, that's heavier than I remembered. The deal with the H2, right, is that it was the spiritual successor to the H1, except not at all. So the H1 was derived from a true military vehicle. This was designed from the ground up to be a civilian vehicle. And what are we looking at underneath the hood? So this is a six liter V8 with 325 horsepower and 365 pound feet of torque. And I must say, with that hood coming all the way up and kind of taking part of the fender with it, you really do have a surprising access to the engine on this if you wanted to work on it. That's what makes these so special, right? Is you get a fun package, but really they have the reliabilities of a GMT 800 platform, including that six liter straight out of an HD truck, which will go a bajillion miles. So they are long lasting engines, very, very durable. The braking system is pretty complex on the H2s compared to a standard um, half ton you know, truck or SUV, but let's check out the inside because that's where things get really cool. Absolutely. Now, the interior on these is like sitting in a lounger. So you got these big, squishy, early 2000s General Motors seats. You got these really squinty windows, so visibility is terrible, but you really feel like you're behind the wheel of something special. Yeah, I really do like the interior of these. You know, it's just simple switch gear, and it those seats are super, super comfy. I hadn't been in an H2 before, and after sitting in this one, I will admit, it is almost as comfortable as like the GMT 800 Yukons and uh, the Suburbans of the day. 100%. Yeah, and, and didn't that six liter come out of the, or wasn't that also in the Cadillac Escalade? It was, yeah, you're totally right. Same era as well. Now this one has some funny accents, like all the yellow everywhere. And granted, some of the stuff looks better than it feels like this shifter. You just want to go ka-chunk, but it's actually made out of really cheap plastic. All right, Brandon, now we do have traction control warning light and a check engine light. Yeah, and uh, this battery is, on its last limbs. It's starting, but <laughs> but barely. Now we also have not much fuel, but that's how all Hummers are. 
Well, that's pretty much out of gas. That's pretty much how all cars here at the auction are, anyways. <laughs> yeah, but especially Hummers. Now these things got pretty legendarily terrible fuel economy. We're talking like 12, 13 mpg, maybe up to 15. Yeah. We actually did a long-term test on one of these. We bought one, and Andre loved it so much he got it from the company. And can you start, kind of understand why? Yeah, I mean, this thing is nice. GM in the early 2000s really knew how to build a super comfortable seat. I just, I wish that we could go back to this because in a road trip or just cruising around town, you know, having a nice comfortable bum on some soft plush leather, there's just nothing better. Yeah, they're so good and they ride really soft, these old Hummers. They're just great truck slash SUVs and they last a super long time. Look, we're following a Mini and a Hummer. <laughs> go! I should just run right into them. <laughs> right. Well, the other thing I noticed too is this sunroof is huge. Well, yeah. the whole thing is, look how far I am away from you. Yeah, that's true. 19 <laughs> yards away from you, Brendan. <laughs> but, I mean, this was before the day of panoramic sunroofs, but this one probably rivals some of the more modern ones. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right, dude, should we uh, accelerate down this test track? Let's see how it does. Uh, what are you going to do if you hit some ice, though? Oh, we're just going to barrel our way through the next county. There we go. <laughs> there goes that six liter. You hear it roaring? Yeah, a little bit of wheel spin. Makes a good sound. Now, look at that ride quality. This is the most comfortable of all the cars we've driven today, I think. It, this is, definitely. I mean, think about it. Hummer knew how to build a more comfortable ride than, in, like, nine years before Mercedes even came out with that G63 AMG. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, one thing I will say, off-road incredible, the tie rods are like spaghetti noodles, so they will fail on you. Something to be careful of. But, yeah, I've driven these things extensively off-road, and even though they got the reputation for being a Beverly Hills cruiser, they go anywhere. Absolutely. So, Brendan, we've driven the H2. We've experienced it. Is this a buy or a bust? Yeah, I've definitely come around on these. I would say buy. 100%. This thing is awesome. They're just great. They're fantastic. They last forever and they look really cool. What's it going to sell for at auction? Now, I will admit, I have never, never looked at the prices on these. So I am taking a pure shot in the dark saying that I think this might go, well, let's see, how many miles are on? 155,000 miles? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I would say 12,000 bucks. Oh. Oh, six. That's exactly my number. Dang it. Oh, I'm no. going to come up with a new number. <laughs> I'm a pretty good guesser, eh? Well, I guess we'll find out. But you know, what is your number? I think that the bidders are going to be enthralled by the yellow wheels and the Tonka graphics and the flames. <laughs> Here's my number. 14 grand. 14 grand, huh? Because you took my number, so i got to pick a new number. <laughs> so you're just a little bit higher than me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we'll see who's closest. Right, and lastly, the Hummer H2, the vehicle we both agreed upon. You predicted 12K. I was a little more optimistic at 14. This is going to be our tiebreaker vehicle today. What happened? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, uh, no one wanted it. So they opened it at $13,000 to crickets. Okay. And he said $12,000, crickets. $11,000, crickets. All right, get it out the door. So no one bid on it <laughs> at all. It dropping as low as $11,000, which I think was below their reserve. Got it. Uh, but it ended up getting no bid. And I think the last one we tied as well because of a no bid scenario. So I think in this one, what was what was the idea that you had, Tommy? Well, I think if it gets no big mid, no, oh. Well, I think if it gets no bids, then clearly the lower number should be the winner. You were the lower number at 12K, so I'm going to let you take this buyer bust episode. Nice work, my dude. All right, thanks. I guess I'll take the win. So, Brendan, we had some disagreements in today's episode, but which of the three vehicles is the one that you would take home? Well, I would say the Land Cruiser for the price, because that's probably the only one I could afford. But <laughs> that one's a bit rough. So, I think... If I had the extra cash sitting around, I'd go home with this guy. Believe it or not, I would take this as well. The value for money is so, well, it's not amazing, but it's pretty good with these, and yeah. they're just so much fun to drive. Get yourself an H2. As Hard always, this has been Tommy and... And Brendan. We'll see you on the next episode of Buy or Bust. Take care.